everyone and welcome to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all news relating to spaceships, starships and uh, sky ships. <laughs> we have lots of exciting stuff to cover this week from the sunny shores of Florida to the frozen tundras of Triton. So strap into your ejector seats and get ready. And remember, if you want to make sure you catch these videos on release, then be sure to smash the subscribe button below so that this news isn't horribly outdated by the time YouTube finally gets around to recommending it to you the other ways. Anyway, intro gaff aside, let us waste no more time jumping into this show's first segment, all the biggest news in spaceflight from last week. Our first piece of news from last week was the exciting launch of a Soyuz 2.1b on the 28th of September. The Soyuz launched from the Plesetska Cosmodrome, successfully carrying the Gonet M satellites number 27, number 28 and number 29 into orbit. These will join the existing satellites in orbit which form the Gonet Satellite System, a Russian civilian low earth orbit communication satellite network. However, they weren't the only payload. The Soyuz is a big lad after all, and in addition to the Gonets, it carried 15 more satellites for a variety of different customers. There were certainly a lot of people relying on this mission, so I am pleased that the launch went successfully. In other news, United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy launch of a classified spy satellite unfortunately did not launch again. It was aborted on October the 1st, once again painfully close to the liftoff. The abort was initiated after an onboard sensor detected a fault which instigated the automated safety shutoff system. While the engine firing initiators weren't ignited, the ones on the launch table did, hence why we still got to see some flames before the shutdown. While the rocket and its classified payload remain safe, United Launch Alliance will need some time to review the data before another launch can be attempted. The company still aims for an October liftoff, so hopefully we won't have to wait too long to see this bird fly. Delta IV Heavy wasn't the only abort on the first. Sadly, on the same day, we also saw the Falcon 9 launch of Starlink 12 abort at T-18 seconds. The abort was due to an anomalous ground sensor reading. The rocket does appear to be in good health though, and SpaceX have confirmed that their next launch attempt for this mission will be on October the 5th this video's upload date. Moving on, Northrop Grumman successfully launched their NG-14 Cygnus spacecraft on October the 2nd. The spacecraft will approach the International Space Station on this video's upload date, and coverage of this will be on NASA television and on the NASA Live website. On board is a new toilet for the astronauts, various science experiments, and some food. Certainly a vital service, so I do hope the success of this mission endures as the spacecraft continues its approach to the space station. Back to scrubs now, unfortunately. On October the 2nd, SpaceX's Falcon 9 launch of a GPS-3 satellite was aborted at T-2 seconds after an unexpected pressurize in the turbo machinery gas generator. So far, there's no word on when SpaceX will be re-attempting this mission, but hopefully it shouldn't be too long. Finally, Blue Origin's New Shepard also didn't launch last week. We are still awaiting confirmation of a launch date, and when I know, you guys will know too. Moving along to some slightly more upbeat SpaceX news over at Boca Chica, Texas, Starship SN8 has been lifted onto its launch mount, ready for testing. Cryo testing for the latest flight-ready Starship prototype, provided there were no hitches, should be underway as this video goes out, with tests scheduled to run from October the 4th through to October the 6th. Looking ahead to post-SN8 prototypes, the SN9's tank section has been completed with the forward dome and common dome due to be stacked this week. Work also continues on the SN10, SN11 and SN12 too, though these prototypes are a fair way from completion as of right now. In very exciting Boca Chica news, Super Heavy 1, the mammoth rocket that will eventually carry the Starship off the launch pad, is still being built. The barrel and dome sections for this silver leviathan are being fabricated and I imagine the vehicle will begin to take shape very soon. SpaceX intend to build several incrementally improved prototypes of the lifter, performing test hops in a similar fashion to the Starship prototypes we've seen thus far. While it might seem like we have a long way ahead of us before the rocket is completed, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has stated that the first full-stack launch to orbit will probably be as early as 2021. 
And so concludes our recap of all the launches that we saw and didn't see last week. And shameless self-promotion, guys. If you're enjoying this video, then please don't forget to click that like button down below. And with that, it's time to move along to our next segment, all the stuff that we have to look forward to during this week. Our first launch this week will be SpaceX's second attempt at launching Starlink 12 atop a Falcon 9 rocket, which, as discussed in our last segment, was scrubbed from October the 1st. SpaceX now intend to launch the mission on this video's upload date, October the 5th, so hopefully it all proceeds nominally. This will be the 13th batch of around 60 of SpaceX's Starlink satellites, which will join their existing fleet of Starlink satellites in orbit. The Starlink mission's ultimate objective is to provide high-speed internet access on a near global level, a mission I think all of us can get behind. If this launch is successful, then we may even get to see Starlink 13 launch very soon afterward, a functionally identical flight to Starlink 12 that is currently planned to lift off on October the 10th. Falcon 9 launches don't stop there. While we haven't had a new launch date for last week's abort of the Falcon 9 GPS-3, there is every chance that we might get another attempt this week. The payload is an upgraded GPS satellite built by Lockheed Martin and is the latest satellite created to help modernize the aging existing GPS fleet. Unfortunately, it's not very likely that we'll get to see United Launch Alliance reattempt launching their gargantuan Delta IV Heavy after last week's abort, as the company continues reviewing all of the data from the failure to try and ensure that the rocket manages to fly successfully on their third attempt. I am still hopeful for an October launch, but this week might be a little too soon. And that's it for all of the launches expected to happen over the next seven days, which means that it's time to move along to this show's next segment. Yes, for the remainder of this video, we'll be journeying down the fascinating rabbit hole of history as we look over all of the best spaceflight anniversaries that we can look forward to over the next seven days. We begin our history segment on this video's upload date, October the 5th, but 115 years ago in 1905, when the Wright brothers flew the Wright Flyer 3 in a historic world record flight distance of 24 miles in 39 minutes. While obviously not spaceflight related news, it's definitely always good to pay respect to your ancestors, and the Wright brothers' contraptions certainly helped shape the course of the 20th century, and so I felt it would be worth acknowledging their achievement on this historic day. Tomorrow, October the 6th, will mark the anniversary of 51 Pegasi B's discovery in 1995. This is exciting stuff, as this was the first exoplanet orbiting another sun-like star to be discovered. This was, as you may imagine, a breakthrough in astronomical research, and 51 Pegasi B became the prototype for a new class of planets called Hot Jupiters, i.e. planets that are physically similar to Jupiter, but with very short orbital periods, as in, they circle their parent stars in very low orbits. Their proximity to their parent stars give rise to high surface and atmospheric temperatures, hence the name Hot Jupiter. 51 Pegasi B is roughly half the mass of Jupiter, and in 2015, the International Astronomical Union announced that it would be given a proper name, Dimidium, which is Latin for half, in reference to the planet being around half the mass of Jupiter. In 2017, traces of water were discovered in the planet's atmosphere, and in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to the planet's discoverers Michel Mayer and Didier Queloz. Also, on October the 6th in 2010, Instagram is founded. Not spaceflight related, granted, but I thought that this is as good a time as any to plug my Instagram account. <sighs> wow. Look at that gram. Nice. Anyway, link in the description. So, um, anyway, in 1959, on October the 7th, history is made in the Soviet Union, when their Luna 3 probe transmits the first ever photographs of the dark side of the moon. As the name would suggest, Luna 3 was the third spacecraft to be sent to the neighborhood of the moon, and while these pictures aren't too impressive by today's standards, they were nonetheless a fascinating insight into our moon's outward-facing side. As you may well know, the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, meaning that its rotation is equal to its orbit such that it's impossible to see the dark side without sending a spacecraft to physically go and look at it. From Earth, only half the moon is ever visible. 
The views provided by the Lunar 3 showed a very different moon to the one we're used to. It showed us mountainous terrain very different to the light side, and several dark craters. The reason for this difference in terrain for the two sides of the moon remains poorly understood to this day. On October the 10th, we'll be able to celebrate the anniversary of another historic discovery, the discovery of Triton, the largest moon of Neptune by English astronomer William Lassell. Triton is an interesting beast, it's the only large moon in the solar system to have a retrograde orbit, i.e. opposite to the rotation of its parent planet, and it's also really big. It's the seventh largest moon in the solar system and the second largest moon in relation to the size of its planet, after the Earth's moon. Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft to have ever visited Triton on a flyby in 1989, during which it found surface temperatures of minus 235 Celsius and active cryovolcanoes, making Triton only one of five moons to be geologically active, the others being Io and Europa of Jupiter and Enceladus and Titan of Saturn. One mission proposition to more thoroughly explore this icy world was the Triton Hopper, a small probe that would land on Triton and mine the surface nitrogen ice to synthesize fuel allowing it to fly, or hop if you will, across its surface. NASA is currently a lot more interested in Saturn and Jupiter's systems unfortunately, but I am sure that one day we'll eventually send another visitor to Triton and its big blue parent. The last day of the week is October the 11th, and a rapid-fire NASA round of anniversaries, let's go! October the 11th, 1958, NASA launches Pioneer 1, the agency's first space probe atop a Thor Able rocket. It was intended to orbit the moon and take scientific measurements, but due to a guidance error it failed to achieve a stable orbit and it ultimately fell back down to Earth, where it was destroyed upon atmospheric re-entry. Exactly 10 years later though, in 1968, NASA launched a more successful mission. This was Apollo 7, the first successful manned Apollo mission. The mission's objective was to test the Apollo Command and Service module in low Earth orbit, which it successfully accomplished over its 11-day flight. This mission would be the first time a Saturn 1B put a crew in space and would be the first three-person American space mission ever. The mission was a complete success and gave NASA the confidence to send Apollo 8 into orbit around the moon two months later. Fast forward to 1984, astronaut Catherine D. Sullivan became the first American woman to perform a spacewalk from the Space Shuttle Challenger. She and mission specialist David Liestma performed the three and a half hour spacewalk in order to operate a system designed to show that satellites could be refueled in orbit. Cracking stuff. Leaping forward to the year 2000, we saw the launch of the 100th Space Shuttle mission, STS-92, a mission to the International Space Station ISS, by Space Shuttle Discovery. The mission was an ISS assembly flight that brought the Z-1 truss, control moment gyros, pressurized mating adapter 3, and two DDU heat pipes to the space station. And uh, that concludes our quickfire NASA round, and with it, the conclusion of this week's history segment. And that about wraps it up for all things space, news, this and week. So I guess there's not much left for me to talk about other than just to say a massive thank you all for watching and shameless plug if you enjoyed this video then please do be sure to leave a like down below and if you want to see more videos like this one then there should be a link to the full Space This Week playlist on the left hand side of your screens. To the right is a video chosen specifically for you based on your viewing habits and finally if you want to check out my Patreon, merch store or any other social media page then you'll find links to that down below. I've waffled on long enough now, so I'm going to just sign off now, lest I outstay my welcome too long.